Thank you, uh, Sheila Page, uh, ODI. And my first research project at ODI almost 30 years ago was on the new foreign investor Japan in Southeast Asia. And I must say a lot of what I've heard today has not been about China, it's been about a new investor. And I feel that this is, I, I don't think BRICS have different views. I think new investors have different views. Inexperienced investors have different views. And I really would like all of the panel to reflect on this a little bit. Uh, because a lot of the questions that were raised could have some light thrown on them this way. For example, Rafi talked about bundling. There's, there's sort of two types of bundling. There's that there is a coordination, formal and informal, among foreign investment, trade, and government. But there's also the statistical problems that the d data are effectively bundled. But this is a problem of new data. <coughs> when a new phenomenon happens, for the first few years, the data are awful. This has been true of everything from foreign investment to non-tariff barriers. <coughs> and I suspect that some of it is because of that. Uh, how much is because, uh, as companies become more involved and we get into the downstairs elements, will they have to have better data? The white paper last year was a major move in this direction. So is this again just newness, not Chinese-ness? Uh, the uh, question of whether they are, which motive they're there for, uh, cost, markets, or resources. Again, this is something which is a question of evolution, as uh, Professor Al Alden pointed out. I would be interested to know in Professor Fu's table to see that weighted by size of company. Because it may be that there are an awful lot of little companies looking for markets, but there is an awful lot of Chinese, if I can use the collective investment, interested in natural resources. I think that might be an interesting sidelight to that table. Uh, and finally, on the low technology as a, as a first step, this was what British investors told me in Southeast Asia, it didn't really matter if you used something that wasn't very good because it was well, what you would start out with as a foreign investor. It, they didn't last long. It was the companies that produced good high-tech investment that lasted a long time. And I wonder among the Chinese companies if this is something which the ones that are going to fail do, not the ones that are going to succeed. All right, thank you. Is anybody else there? Over there, gentlemen over there. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Su Yu Liu from uh, University of Oxford. I would like to address a question which is about uh, the localization of the employment of the Chinese investment there. Uh, this uh, I noticed the situation that the labor cost in China or for the Chinese population has been increased significantly. And will this uh, significantly affect the employment situations uh, in African countries, uh, especially in the Chinese FDI firms? Uh, I do notice that uh, nowadays for the uh, labor intensive is more and more localized, but how about the more technology uh, intensive the industries, like especially when we notice that the technology development in African countries is also improving. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, gentleman over here. Thanks. My name is Gordon Crawford from the University of Leeds, Center for Global Development. Um, there's little been said about the, the flow of people, of uh, Chinese migrants to, uh, to Africa. And um, I'm just wondering if the panel could comment on, on how significant a phenomenon they see this to be and uh, what are the main research issues associated with it and when, whether these are above the radar issues or below the radar issues. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, there's a gentleman over here. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Ian Lane, freelance uh, consultant. Um, I was surprised to learn that this phenomena started in 2005. I was in Lesotho in 1971. We had a, a vegetable uh, project of the Chinese government. Uh, I was in Tanzania for four years from 75. Uh, Tanzam Railway, significant investment. But equally, we had uh, all our hand tools, our pangas, our t measuring tapes. These were Chinese manufactured, privately marketed. Why? Because they were superior to local products. 
Tanzania, 75, flying pigeon, no one would be without their means of transport. Regarding quality, I note in The uh, Economist that uh, present day strip down of construction machinery, the best Chinese products equals that anywhere in the world. Uh, other manufactured products may not be quite as good. Um, I think essentially we're looking at economics and uh, that applies to everything that we're interested in here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I've got one uh, or several questions online. I'll just read one, uh, read one and then I'll hand back to the panel. Uh, this is from Jennifer Azuta. She's a freelance journal journalist based in Dakar uh, and on behalf of IRIN. Uh, and she asks, youth unemployment here in West Africa is a huge issue. What can be done to include more young people in the labor force? So I suppose, is there a question, uh, can we learn from China perhaps, or is, is there a role for, uh, for, uh, for China in this? Um, what I propose is that we, uh, we take the same sequence. Uh, so perhaps, uh, Rafi, you'd like to uh, start and, ta and be a bit selective because we've heard quite a few uh, different questions. And I've spoken too long. I will address the first and the last of those. Not that I don't have views on the others, but uh, there's no time. Uh, Shida's question. I think it's an open question whether there's something about Chinese foreign investment which is distinctly different from other forms of foreign investment, which is not just a function of time. Uh, now, sorry, we completed a study on the indirect impacts on many developing countries of China's presence, which is on the global commodity sector. For example, the Nigerian Chinese trade is a small volume of trade, but the price Nigeria gets for its oil in world markets is influenced by China's demand for oil globally. So a very good example of indirect impacts where the direct measures were. Anyway, uh, so the, we then looked at the global commodity sector, which is going through a massive transformation. And there are important but unnoticed and unrecognized changes as a consequence of China's demand for commodities, not just on the prices of commodities, but on who owns the sector. And the distinctive thing about Chinese investments in the commodity sector are two. Firstly, they're, more, they're less risk averse. And secondly, they've got patient capital. That is, they have access to funds which is not mediated by financialization. They don't have to report to the stock market every three months. And the chief executives don't get paid on the basis of the share prices. So that would be an example of a structural difference between Chinese investors and non-Chinese investors. And hiding behind this is Frederick Winslow Taylor, one best way in labor organization, 1917, or is it 1911, and Fukuyama, the end of history. That is <coughs> convergence. So Sheila's question seems to me to raise a really important point. Is China moving into a position where in 10 or 15 years' time it will be distinguishable, indistinguishable as a political economy from contemporary Anglo-Saxon dominated capitalism, even though we know that there's a big debate between Rhenish capitalism, that is continental capitalism and Western capitalism. So I would like to pose this Sheila's point as a research hypothesis and say, is it true or isn't true that there's something which is structurally different about Chinese activities in Africa, which reflects Chinese political economy, and which means that we won't move to inevitable convergence of society and economies, first point. Second one, the last point of youth unemployment from mm -hmm. Dakar. Uh, what first grabbed me uh, in this, why I went into cheap Chinese capital goods, was remember I mentioned the AERC program. We did, four, uh, AERC, I was part of that program, did 14 in-depth country studies of China and Africa. I, I, we, couldn't get the researchers to look beyond direct impacts, but that's a separate story. They focused on direct impacts. The, the piece from, by, uh, from, by Sunday Khan from Cameroon was riveting. He looked at batteries and he looked at motorcycles. Chinese batteries have half the life of Japanese batteries, but they cost one-third as much. Chinese motorcycles are very poor quality, but they're very, very cheap. And here's the youth unemployment thing. What Sunday Khan found was that young school leavers were able to buy bicycles and became logistics operators. They started delivering, they started producing sh uh, cheap taxis. So this point about the appropriateness of 
capital goods from the rising powers, the lowering of acquisition costs, the, the <coughs> dynamism of small-scale entrepreneurship, I think, has implications for employment in general and youth unemployment in particular. Sorry, youth unemployment in general and employment in particular. Uh, which brings me to the point about, somebody asked about migrants. It's a massive phenomenon. Giles Mohan has done some really interesting work in it. I think the historically significant thing about China and Africa are the things that are below the radar. These people who are in the country doing things, farming, small-scale petty trading, <laughs> then we're going into petty manufacturing, joint ventures, Africans going to China to buy things, then coming back to Africa to sell them. One of my PhD students funded a PhD by buying leather goods in China and taking them back to Botswana. But from that, you develop these bilateral informal relationships and you get a dynam dynamism, not just in China, not just in Africa, but also in China and in this growing interrelationship between the two. Thank you. Lots below, below the radar. Uh, Shaolong. Uh, yeah, I will um, respond to a few questions uh, uh, um, raised. First, I want to add to Rafi's uh, discussion about the uniqueness of Chinese investment. I think another uh, uniqueness of Chinese investment is the use of more labor-intensive technology. Uh, like in the, the, the tables I show, both in the construction sector, the Chinese firms use more labor and the less machine less capital intensive machine. While in the uh, non-Chinese firms, uh, construction firms, they use more machines and less workers. This is uh, similar in many of the sectors if we compare Chinese and the OECD multinationals. And uh, this is not only because China is still a middle income country, but also because China itself is is um, a country with uh, a, a reservoir of uh, uh, unskilled or semi-skilled labor. And therefore, firms in China use this type of labor-intensive technology more efficient. And therefore, they go to Africa, they still use this labor-intensive technology in the same sector uh, in comparison you know, with other multinationals. But this has the implications, significant implications on employment. Because labor-intensive projects, they use more worker, create more jobs. And therefore, Chinese investment uh, has more significant uh, employment effect. Uh, I also use some cross-country uh, uh, um, uh, data, which also find a significant positive effect on employment of Chinese multinational. And another um, uh, 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 feature is uh, the UNCTAD data shows Chinese investment in Africa. 96, 97% are greenfield projects. Uh, which, you know, uh, in comparison with uh, uh, traditional uh, multinationals in Africa, others have more uh, merge and acquisition, which does not add more job. But Chinese, most are doing greenfield, 97, that's OEC, uh, um, uh, uh, UNCTAD data. So these greenfield uh, projects will create more job than, uh, um, than merge and acquisition. Th um, these two uh, uh, features, uh, both have uh, implications for employment, including the youth uh, 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 employment. Uh, and uh, uh, again, about Sheila's uh, question on um, uh, weight. Uh, yes, uh, if we weight this by assets or weight by number of employees, especially assets, um, the picture will change because different industries have different characteristics. In the resource sector, it's capital intensive. Therefore, if we use capital as weight, we'll see more weight in, the, uh, in, in resource uh, than in, in others. But if we look at the number of employment, etc., then we'll see a different, different picture. Uh, and uh, finally, I think it's a very important question, is whether Chinese multinationals will you know, fail in the end or, or, or succeed in, in Africa. This is also a question I have been asking uh, myself uh, in the research. I think <coughs> they have to improve, especially localization especially you know, uh, in terms of uh, uh, some standards close to the uh, 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 international or the, the, the host country uh, 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 regulation. I think that is something that um, Chinese firms should learn and, and, and improve um, uh, until one day they really become a citizen embedded in the society and the economy. They will survive there and they will thrill, they will you know, prosper there. If um, they do not build sufficient linkage and do not impact in, in the host country society, um, I do have worries uh, for, their, for their future, whether you know, it's sustainable. 
or, or not. Yeah. Thank you. Chris. Uh, just <coughs> briefly, I mean, I think the primary, to Sheila's question, the primary characteristic at least, or a key characteristic is, is one, uh, non-OECD DAC uh, uh, starting point. Second is it's a developing country. That falls for the BRICS, uh, not the BRICS, say the IBSA or any of the other, the, the South Koreas is uh, emerging. And that, I think that introduces a different starting point, a different perspective on what it means to develop. It's not an abstraction. It's, a, it's rooted in, in experience, experiences of all the individuals. Um, the uh, Chinese migrants, just to throw some stats out, one, a Chinese, uh, uh, an Angolan minister in China quoted, was quoted a couple of years ago saying there were 200,000 uh, Chinese that had migrated. Uh, last year, uh, Chinese, est an estimate by um, a, a firm doing work on security, a Chinese firm doing work on security questions said there were estimated 400,000. So the numbers, of course, are open, but there are a lot of, of uh, the, the, the figures are high, much higher than you would have expected perhaps. Um, and then, of course, the gentleman who said things started earlier. I, I, I don't think any of us thought that China just arrived in 1996 or something, just that uh, the current uh, economically robust <laughs> China and Chinese capital really started moving more recently. All right. Uh, Shambo? Yeah. Um, just a few quick words on uh, youth employment um, in Africa. When I was working in Nigeria, lots of I had lo lots of friends who who are doing the so-called NYIC programs in Nigeria, which is like a scheme which offers graduate students a two-year, uh, a six months to one year work experience in the in the government. I met a lot of them, and uh, most of them were saying to me that to find a job in Nigeria, you have to f you, you have to know somebody, and that's plainly the the situation they were facing, and I I would say to to some extent. Um, that is probably a global situation we're facing at we're, we're, we're facing at the moment for young people. Um, youth employment globally is a is is really is, is is not easy at all. When I was in Barcelona talking to my Spanish friends, they were saying youth employment in, in Barcelona, youth unemployment in Spain is at the moment is as much as twenty five percent, and uh, which which points a very sort of gray global picture for for youth um, employment, and uh, in terms. Just a very quick word on the flow to f um, on people flow between China and Africa. Um, one Nigerian diplomat told told me that there are as much as twenty thousand Nigerians living in Guangzhou alone. Um, that's a huge figure, I have to say. Um, and, uh, and and also when I was traveling through Addis Ababa, uh, sometimes I'm re truly struck by how many Chinese workers there are using Addis Ababa as an as a, as a African transport center to go to different parts of Africa. And I usually I talk to them and ask them where they come from and w how long they've been working in Africa. And to my surprise, sometimes they, t they tell me most of, of their village, sometimes in, in their villages in China, would just go entirely as a village to work in Africa for a couple of years or sometimes longer, either to grow vegetables for the state and the price or to do something very simple and then and, and then come back. And when I ask them how much do they earn, how, wh what kind of arbitrage can you make um, from working in Africa as opposed to working in Shanghai or Beijing in one of the more developed cities in China, they said the difference isn't huge, but it's large enough to make me move. So, so, so there's some personal experiences, once again, to offer on those questions. Thank you. Very good. Um, um, I think that we've heard from the four panelists at least that there is something unique about uh, China that is worthwhile uh, in, in, uh, investigating. Um, let's go to, uh, to to the final round of comments uh, or questions. Um, there, there are two here, a lady here on the right, and a gentleman there. Some, some quick points, please. Sure, Lizzie Parsons from Global Witness. I'm interested in the rise or increase in transparent operations by Chinese companies. One of the ways, of course, to tackle this issue of misconception is by companies being more transparent and to tackle other risks. Um, at the same time, you have a number of different international and national mechanisms, such as the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative or different uh, laws now which oblige companies to do more due diligence with respect to uh, sourcing from conflict zones. So I just wonder if the panel have any comments around that. Thanks. All right. Here's a gentleman over there. 
Andrew Ross from Global Garden. My question is broadly the similar one. What will be the uh, reaction by Western companies, particularly affecting the supply chain consequences that they see? And in particular, because I come from the City of London, looking at how the financing of projects is very seriously undermined where there isn't transparency and where we can very obviously see sustainability not being included in any of the financial calculations. Very good. And then the gentleman at the back, please. Uh, my name is Nzita. I'm an independent economist. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the ODI for this event early because there are quite a lot of uh, misconceptions between the relationship between Africa and uh, and uh, China. And I hope the relationship between Panda and Giraffe will have an impact on Western uh, government as well. Because now I start to hear, even if French intellectuals are saying, oh, we want to Africa win-win, win-win. But um, you never heard this before. So now, my point is this is about quality, Chinese product quality. If I do remember, uh, reading the biography probably of Lee Yakoka in the 80s, uh, an American uh, chief executive asked him, uh, asked a Chinese, uh, Japanese a chief executive of Toyota probably, who is going to buy your car here in the 50s in the US? And the Japanese chief executive look at him and say, um, I think a poor black American. Thank you. All right, in on the left. Um, my name is Hwai Tan Rei from Loy Horoi, London University. Um, I would like to ask the panel members about the view of the uh, Angular model, because you mentioned a lot about the uh, unique features of Chinese uh, engagement in Africa. Um, I, I started to research Chinese investment in Africa from 2005. Um, the first the interview I got was the Africa um, uh, chief of uh, China's Export Import Bank. And he emphasized a lot throughout his three hours interview about Angular model. He believed that Angular model is the most important uh, um, let's say, most important uh, mechanism for China to engage in Africa. Um, when when Rafi mentioned all these different uh, motivations, actually his Angular model explained all of this. For example, Angular model basically based on the China's demand for the commodity. Then this demand leads the Chinese uh, aid and uh, lower interest loan to Africa. Then this will lead to the Chinese export of equipment and labor force to Africa. Then, you know, so this is relevant to market thinking, of you, you mentioned, yeah. Then later on, of course, uh, I, I don't have time to elaborate. They also uh, transform to the efficient seeking as well, yeah. Um, I, over the years, I in probably engaged about more than 300 Chinese firms in Africa. Um, now, roughly, I just thought, probably more than 80% of the firms that I visited or interviewed relevant to this angular model. For example, they probably come as an oil investor firm, or they probably as a supplying firm. They just sell the equipment to them. Or they're actually as a kind of construction firm, but that construction project is part of this uh, angular model deal as well. So I think that is uh, one feature. Another, I just say that, is aid for trade and investment. That is another model which the Chinese emphasize a lot. So far, I haven't heard about that mm -hmm. yet. So I would like to have your comments. Thank right. you. Thank you. Uh, Hannah Ryder from DFID, um, working on the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation. Um, I had two very quick questions, just about um, two things which uh, I'm not sure we've heard so much about. Um, one, how much research has there been and um, is, there, is there more forthcoming on um, comparative policies of African governments towards um, China. So, for instance, with regards to employment, which came up earlier, with regards to environmental policies or migration laws, etc. 
I'm, it would be interesting, I think, to, um, to understand you know, what the impacts of those different policies may have been and how far they differ. Uh, secondly, um, we've talked a lot about Chinese companies, but not so much about the Chinese government. And Chinese government does do quite a lot of technical assistance, um, also known as knowledge sharing in some circles. How much research has there been with regards to the quality of that um, knowledge sharing um, on different policies, and um, what impact does it have? All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll uh, think about uh, reading three three more questions, and then we hand back to the to the panel because I also know that uh, Chris, you also need to leave quite soon. Um, there's one question from uh, Sue Kenny uh, from Nairobi, and she asks, "What is the Chinese approach to creating Africa China's SME joint ventures and multicultural teams?" Uh, there is a question from Richard Grant uh, from the University of Miami. Uh, could any of the panelists address the issue of how China has affected urban development in Africa? Uh, and then the final question, um, is there a role for China to assist regional economic communities? Um, uh, and if so, what is that from Barney Walsh? Um, so if any of the, um, the panelists would like to... Uh, uh, to come back to, uh, to, uh, to any of these questions. Of course, the purpose of this meeting is to generate a lot of research questions um, that might be answered by the research that, 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 uh, that you could apply for which, we, for, for which we will hear much more on after the break. Um, but uh, maybe you could, you could pick one or two questions again and be, uh, be brief, and then we hand over to the next uh, Be second. brief, you said, right. <laughs> uh, the two that I'm least ignorant about are the following. Uh, I'm it may be that there's something culturally specific about China, but that doesn't interest me much. I'm interested in the structural questions about whether there's something distinctive about China because it's a newly industrializing country or because it has a large state-owned presence or because of the nature of its firms, which suggests that structurally its interaction with Africa is different to OECD economies. And I want to just draw two bits of evidence. <coughs> the first is the question of labor standards and other things. Uh, I had my PhD students, two of my PhD students, uh, do one on Africa, one on Thailand. What happens when the final market shifts from OECD countries to China? What happens to the value chains? And it's an interesting story, for two important implications. Firstly, uh, many value chains, access to final markets is affected by a series of standards which are driven by civil society. Labor standards, organic standards, corruption, e e EITI, whatever. The significant thing when the market moves to China is that those standards become much less important. And both in the case of Thailand exporting cassava and Gabon exporting timber to Africa, to China, when they shifted market from Europe to China, the importance of, of standards diminished. That had implications for the environment, that had implications for working conditions. It also had implications for learning, because standards is often an important route for learning, but it has implications also for the incorporation of small firms and relatively poorly educated people, because standards are very knowledge intensive mm -hmm. and very formal structure intensive. So when the market shifted, and I've got many other examples I don't want to talk about, there's something because China's a low-income economy, because it has poorly developed civil society, you know the phrase songs, state-owned, non-governmental organizations, because there are these characteristics about China, it affects the value change in which people are incorporated. Secondly, and this relates to the uh, uh, issue of the Angola mo mode or Angola model. I don't know how many people know this. It was due for Chinese wonks or China African wonks. The Angola model means a lot, but it doesn't necessarily mean a lot to other people. And it, it derives from Angola, where China said, look, we'll build infrastructure uh, and you can pay for it with oil receipts. Some of the money for that infrastructure will be aid. What is aid? Some will be foreign investment, some will just be trade credits. We will, however, give the money not to Angola, but to a fund in China which a list of Chinese firms can bid for, so the decision is made in China, not Angola, and there will be minimum content of imports from China in those investments. So this bundling of aid and trade production paid for by resources 
is an important characteristic of China, and you could well argue that that's something which reflects the prevalence of large uh, state-owned enterprises in China, which does not occur with OECD investment. So those would be two examples, it seems to me, which suggest researchable hypotheses, which we all need to ask, going back to Sheila's original question. Is there one best way? Is, there, is it all going to be the same in the end? Or is there something distinctive about the rising powers in general, and I would say China in particular, because of patient capital? Is there something different? But I think that's a researchable topic. I would like to make one other point, and mm -hmm. then I'll stop. <coughs> quality and quality of goods. One mustn't underestimate. Uh, I don't want to be in a position where I'm seen to argue that China is a good thing for Africa, and it's win-win. It's much more complex than that, right? I want to point to two elements which are often under-recognized. As in Europe, there has been a major welfare benefit to consumers because of the low cost of Chinese consumption goods. Clothing, and if you look at one different interesting study from South Africa, where South Africa's import shifted over a period of three or four years to China, the unit price of clothing fell with very significant implications for poor people, not just for poor consumers, but because they reduced the price of wage goods, they also had knock-on effects for investment and production as well. So in a curious way, consumer goods are also producer goods. And secondly, the examples I try to give of China, actually Indian tractors in Africa, uh, Chinese capital goods in Kenyan furniture, Chinese sewing machines in Uganda, is that these are, I'm going to qualify this in a minute, these are poor quality capital goods by any standards but they are absolutely appropriate to Africa and to poor producers in Africa. Uh, my qualification is that China is 1.3 billion people, right? It produces, it's got firms which produce rubbish, but in Germany, metal good imports from China were rated as a higher quality than metal good imports from other OECD economies. So simultaneously you have rubbish from China, quote unquote, coming into Africa as capital goods, but there has a capacity to upgrade and to move into Chinese firms. So these welfare effects and the implications in reducing the cost of capital goods, reducing the acquisition cost of capital goods, are two very important components of China's relationship with Africa, which are often under-recognized. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Um, Sharon. Yeah, I want to uh, yeah, uh, maybe talk on, uh, on two issues. One is come back to the efficiency seeking uh, um, um, FDI and also whether the success story of the special economic zones in China and in East Asia can be replicated in, um, in Africa. Um, and I think we also need to not only look at all the factors that, uh, that Jimbo uh, earlier has discussed, but also think about the, the, uh, the factors, other factors that uh, will lead the success of a special economic zone, which can serve as a catalyst for industrialization of the country. Uh, I think there are, looking at the success of East Asia and the China, I think there are other factors the literature has not picked up. One is the timing. It's the opportunity window. It's not, you know, uh, um, all, you can always succeed. And there are opportunity, uh, certain times in history that you can see, like the East Asia, all the uh, special economic zone multinationals move from East Asia to China. It's one, the, the labor cost, land cost in those, uh, in Korea, in Japan, increase, the multinationals relocate to Southeast Asia. When the cost in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, Thailand, wait, the real wage goes up, they relocate to China. And that is a certain time in history. I think that's a, uh, the, the, the timing, the opportunity window in history uh, that China has seized, those countries have seized this uh, opportunity. And the whether there is an opportunity for Africa now, uh, although I think there is an opportunity rising for Africa because the real wages, the land cost, the, the resource cost, all everything in China is going up significantly. And the surplus labor in China is running out. And there is, uh, you know, already, a trend of relocation of the firms. However, not only Africa, but there are other destinations are competing for that. Uh, Vietnam, Myanmar, and other uh, 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 countries in, in South Asia. And also, 
the success of East Asia also relates to the environment, you know, the neighbors, the success of China in assembling, in processing, because the neighbors have, are good at producing the key components, Korea, Japan, uh, Malaysia, they're, they're, ne they're nearby, and therefore China can serve, uh, geographically can serve as the assembly plant to do the final assembly and processing. Whether Africa have those kind of neighbors there, or we just imagine, I think that's another thing I think ignored by the policy policymakers. Uh, they want to create a uh, special economic zone in Nigeria and hope the Nigerian firms can quickly, you know, fit into the global value chain. But where, the, where are the components? Where uh, are the, uh, you know, uh, materials come from? The second is the local capabilities. Whether we can jump, jump directly into international market. China succeeded because China has a pool of labor force with middle school, higher school education, with threshold level of education. That's how China different from India. Why is China succeed, you know, become a global manufacturing plant, while India didn't? Then whether African firms can, you know, going through a big leapfrogging without building the capabilities, without building the, the capabilities first to compete in the domestic market. Uh, building the, the capabilities to produce something which they do not produce before and directly fit into the global value chain and uh, compete in the international market. I think the special economic zone in Africa probably based on the assumption that they can jump without building up, without that gradual learning process. That is why I think probably res partly, partially responsible for the empty zones in Nigeria. Those are the explanations. Finally, I just want to mention, I think it's very important uh, we didn't respond to the flow of people between Africa and, uh, and, and China. I think that's a very important, significant uh, element uh, in China-Africa uh, engagement. Accompanying with this people flow, I think there are issues which worth to explore is the trade relationship. Whether yeah, built on this, lead to the uh, trade relationship, maybe this is a two-way, and the investment relationship, and also uh, about knowledge diffusion through people's movement. Um, these are all very interesting questions, and the culture integration and the understanding, whether, you know, like, like Chris said, is Africa uh, uh, influenced China and China influenced Africa. So I think a lot of questions uh, around this people flow. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, to answer or to respond to the urban development in uh, question, I think the Angolan case um, has been written about by Marcus Power and Sylvia Cross and might be interesting to, to look at that work. Um, uh, the the, the uh, themes when it comes to, well, the, it comes to your question, the, um, the conventional view is that state-led firms have responded uh, have, have been, have, there are more levers for the, for the government to, to press <coughs> higher standards upon, and state firms, led firms themselves, desire to uh, improve their standards at what have you. Uh, and that the real outliers are the private companies which are behaving badly around the continent and that sort of thing. I think those are still open. There's, that's, that's the conventional view. I don't think enough research has been done to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to make that assumption, uh, to, to, to see that as, a, as a, a workable assumption as far as transparency and the concerns that both, both of you had said. So it seems to me that's a research agenda. I like very much the, the agenda about comparative studies of um, pol African policy making. I know at SIA, at South African Institute, the research that was commissioned, that we commissioned in part attempted to do that, but we didn't do it across the, we did it sort of implicitly. Here's an anecdote here, here's one there, rather than doing it systematically, and it'd be interesting to do that mm -hmm. systematically. Um, on the notion of um, well, mo China as model, uh, returning to the DFID uh, ESRC call, uh, one question might be around the, uh, uh, to, to people have talked about African states looking east, in some senses recalibrating themselves to be development states, at least rhetorically so, some, some possible actual learning going on. It would be interesting to look at African firms, the degree to which African firms take as their point of departure a Chinese, uh, a Huawei or, or another equivalent and, and 
uh, versus um, uh, looking to traditional Western actors in that field. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm time conscious, so I'll be very quickly touching on two questions. Firstly, on the Ang Angola model, first of all, very much looking forward to learn about your research on this topic, and uh, such a big survey of firms. But uh, I think I think the essence of this model is that the money never leaves China. I think I think that's and, and then the African counterparts get their project delivered. From my point of view, I think that's good. Yeah, very short answer. <laughs> and then uh, in terms of knowledge sharing um, from sort of Chinese government perspective, over here at ODI in the summer we had the pleasure of hosting uh, uh, Chinese uh, MOFCOM officials uh, who came here to share their development expertise. And I remember Sheila uh, was, was asking the question um, to, to the, those delegates and she said the Chinese developmental approach to Africa is 90, very 19th century, if, if I may uh, quote you on that. I think although China is an old player in Africa, it's a very young player in, ter in, t in terms of international development. And the government is very conscious in terms of um, promoting any sense of a development model. And I don't even think you know, they, they, they believe there is a model to be followed, but it, there are lessons to be learned. There, there's a huge difference over there. And um, when I talk to those Chinese MOFCOM um, Ministry of Commerce officials who are in charge of foreign aid, I realize there's a surprisingly a uh, small number of officials who is in charge of this field or, or department. And um, I, don't, I, I think although they have the willingness to engage more and more in um, promoting developmental experiences, I think there's a capacity gap in terms of how much they can do so. And when, when, I, when I ask them how you're going to bridge that in the future, they always tell you this very sort of long-term perspective view that eventually they'll catch up, but they are at the moment still a um, student, if you like. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I thought it was a very interesting meeting. Um, I started out saying that we had a meeting on, uh, uh, on, on China, uh, the role of China in low-income countries three years ago, and that was uh, jointly with JICA at that stage, uh, who, who had this view to say, well, uh, there are misconceptions about the Japanese model. Uh, maybe if we have a meeting on China, uh, they start to understand Japan also better. But I think here we, we started to think much more about uh, the uniqueness and the unique structural characteristics of of, of China and uh, and how that might have an impact on uh, on, uh, on African countries directly, indirectly, uh, through various routes. And I thought that was uh, very interesting. Um, we'll uh, so this is the the first part. We'll put all the presentations online. Uh, the uh, the meeting uh, is recorded, so the recordings will also be be online. So if you've missed something, you can still uh, still view it later. Um, but uh, let us um, thank the, uh, the participants uh, and the, um, uh, the panelists. Um, before um, I, we do that, um, uh, we'll uh, hand over soon to, to uh, Dan Colwell uh, and Stephen Lee from Diffid and Irsa C uh, in a minute. So uh, it's probably better if you don't leave the room. Maybe you can stand up and, and shake and, uh, uh, a bit to have a, have a little bit of a break. But for those who, uh, who want to leave, can, uh, can, can do so. And for those who are very interested in the Diffid Irsa C China and Africa Research Program and uh, the details of this program should definitely stay. Uh, and that also uh, that also applies to uh, to the hundred or so uh, online viewers who we have. So um, maybe just stay with us uh, uh, for for one or two two, two minutes. Um, let us thank the the four brilliant panelists for their insights. <laughs>